Marhaba and welcome to Free Palestine Pod, the podcast. I'm Lama Bazzari. And I'm Lina Hadi. Each week, we will bring you in-depth commentary from Palestine. Let's talk Palestine. Today on the show, we welcome Palestinian-American comedian, speaker, writer, and academic Amr Zahar. Drawing on his experiences growing up as a child of Palestinian refugees, Amr's lecturing and sold out comedy tours globally cover topics that include Palestinian politics, culture, and identity. He's also the author of the popular blog, The Civil Arab, and the author of his first book, Being Palestinian Makes Me Smile. Marhaba Amr, and welcome to Free Palestine, Paul. Let's talk Palestine. Hi, Hi Salamat. Good to see you guys. Pleasure having you with us today. Your family background, Amr, is a Palestinian-infused mixed cocktail. Can you share with us how this shaped you growing up as a Palestinian child of refugees and your sense of humor and also as a lawyer turned comedian? Well, sure. I mean, both my parents were always Palestinian activists. I mean, that's how they met on campuses in the 70s in America. So Palestine brought them together. And uh, my parents are both Palestinian refugees as well from uh, Akka and Nazareth. And my dad is Christian. My mom is Muslim. So I'm kind of like related to everybody in Palestine. And so that's uh, that was an interesting sort of dynamic growing up. But activism was always in their blood. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, we moved to America when I was three. And I remember as as a kid, we they would fill up the car with me and my brother and they would take us in the 80s to anti-apartheid meetings to fight against South African apartheid. So this kind of fighting for justice and, and activism has always been something that I was raised on. And so when I went to uh, high school, I knew I was different. We knew we were different, but I tried to fit in. I tried to be white. And then it kind of it kind of hits you at a certain point. For me, it was the first Gulf War where I ran for class president and somebody wrote on my face, go home terrorist. And then that's when I knew I was like, you know, OK, you kind of have no choice. You know, this this thing follows you being Arab, being Palestinian. And I got much more active in high school and then in college and then just kind of haven't really stopped. You know, I'm not really a lawyer turned comedian because I was in law school when I started comedy. And when I graduated, I just started doing comedy. And I said, let me try this comedy thing. And if I fail, I'll go become a lawyer. And so uh, luckily they started paying me to tell uh, jokes. And it's and it's been that life since forever. So I'm more of a uh, a potential lawyer turned comedian. That's what that's what I am. Yeah. OK, so. I'm so excited to meet you, Ahmed. As you know, my mother is a huge, was a huge Ali Arhamha fan of yours. Yeah, like, yes, and I know yes, that yes, you've been, her. I know that you've been to our house in the capital and uh, she spent time with you and she loved you so very much. And I think one of the reasons that she had so much respect for you was in fact, because you did in fact study law. You do in fact have a Juris Doctorate in law, yet at the same time you you opted to be a comedian, which is probably maybe, I think you're obviously happier. I can tell you from my experience, sounds like you're happier. But how do you use the law to actually help with your profession as a comedian? You know, some of my first comedy tours were called We're Not White about Arab Americans because the American government calls us white. And that's a legal and historical issue is how that happens. So our story and our activism is all tied up in civil rights. And with a lot of that comes legal history. And so I actually still teach now. I teach at a law school here in Detroit as an adjunct professor, uh, the history of Arab Americans and their relationship to race in America and the legal system and how we became white. And I've told jokes about that as well. So, I mean, they're very connected, you know, sort of my legal studies background and my comedy. We became white in this country all because of deep, deep sort of racism and white supremacy and and Jesus. It's actually Jesus's fault. So, we, you know, Jesus is a Palestinian, as I tell everybody all the time. And America, I don't know if you know this, Lena and Lemma, but America has like a little bit of a racist history. Just a little, you know, Lena, I don't know if you just like just a little bit. So when white people came to America 400 years ago, they actually came to America because they believed 
that they were being persecuted against because of their religion in Europe, and they came to America because they believed God promised them America. So I don't know if that sounds familiar, but that's how they came to America 400 years ago. Eventually, they decided to make wanted to make a country. They wrote a Declaration of Independence. They said all men are created equal. It turns out they didn't really mean everybody. And then they wrote a constitution. And in the constitution, it says Congress makes laws for naturalization of becoming a citizen. Then they made the first naturalization law in 1790. And the first naturalization law in 1790 stated the requirements for citizenship. And one of the requirements for citizenship is that you had to be white. That was in the law. The law said you had to be white. And that was the law from 1790 all the way until 1952. So pretty long time for whiteness to be be a requirement for American citizenship. And so when Arabs started showing up about 120 years ago, they called it all Syria at that time, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Syria. And they were almost all Christian. And so this Arab guy named George showed up in L.A. and they told him he wasn't white. And then he ended up in court, you know, because the immigration officers told him that he's not white. But, you know, Arabs are never happy with like the first answer. They always need to like talk to the manager or see who's around. So, you know, he got in front of the judge and the judge said to him, uh, tell us why you should uh, be uh, admitted to America. In other words, why you should be white. And George stood up. You have to imagine it's 1909. It is a court in California. And this Arab guy stands up and he says to the judge, he says to him, judge, I am from where Jesus is from. And if you say that I am not white, then you are saying Jesus is not white. Mm. And this white judge looked at George and he said to him, amen. And he stamped his naturalization papers. And so that's how we became white. We actually became white because a white judge in California wanted Jesus to be white. I mean, they've made everybody white. They made you, me, Lemma, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, everybody white just so they could have Jesus. You know, comedy is is a lot of it is about like ridiculousness and pointing out the hypocrisy in the world. And so that sort of ridiculousness can become comedy. You know, it's a fact. I mean, this is a true story, but it's it's comedic at the same time. So. Our uh, legal history everywhere in the world is uh, perfect material for comedy. Definitely brilliantly combined your humor as a tool to educate people about Palestine, but you also make fun of Palestinian culture, including idiosyncrasies of our uh, life and our names of our towns. Who's been your toughest audience or show so far, Amr? Well, believe it or not, Palestinians are totally okay with uh, laughing at ourselves. I mean, we don't really have a problem with it. Art uh, as a way to tell our story has been part of what we've been doing for a really long time. So I've never really gotten pushback from Palestinians on sort of laughing at ourselves and seeing the the funny aspects of our culture. I I would say pro-Israel people are my toughest audience, but they don't really come to my shows. You know, I mean, they follow me online, though, very closely, and uh, they comment a lot, which is fun. I thank them for the traffic. But uh, my toughest crowds, especially in the beginning, I don't want to say tough, but were like white crowds who were still sort of like this was new to them, hearing Arabs talk about themselves uh, on a comedy stage. It's still, frankly, new in America. I mean, it's only like at the most 15 or 20 years old that there's Arab comedians out there in big numbers talking about us. Luckily, I don't really think of tough crowd. I mean, you you learn a comedy is this weird art form where it doesn't exist without a crowd. It's not like if you're a musician, you can go into a studio and make a recording and then tell people, hey, listen to this beautiful music. Or if you're a poet, you can make a recording or comedy is this art form where it doesn't exist without a crowd. So Every crowd to me is different and every crowd is like a different experience. And I kind of I kind of like that dynamic. So, you know, I don't really think in terms of like tough crowds or anything like that. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I've been doing this for a while that I can sort of read crowds. I haven't bombed in a really, really long time. I mean, not since like the very beginning. So, I mean, I've been pretty lucky in that way. So the nature of the art form is that the crowd becomes part of your performance. So they're sort of like your partners along the way. So I don't I don't view them in any sort of like a adversarial way. So I got to ask you about how the life is in the Midwest. We're actually very curious over here. I've been to Dearborn. I had a case there and I had to stay three months. I was a few years ago, but um, I was too busy to actually get a feel for the culture or the vibe. But the big question is, can you exercise your Palestinianness in the Midwest these days? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, look, being Palestinian is becoming 
more and more hip in America. Things have changed fundamentally in the last 10 years, I would say. Whereas uh, a lot of times it was uh, sort of taboo. It's becoming now there's still some red lines in certain parts of society, uh, entertainment, the, the media. It's still hard to break through those things. But in everyday society it is becoming more and more. Now, I don't want to say acceptable, more and more people, people are becoming more educated about Palestine, especially younger people. And so saying you're Palestinian now is cool and hip, whereas it was uh, not that way 10 years ago. And that's due to the work over decades of activists and, and you know, our parents and grandparents and all that kind of stuff. And obviously the work of activists today, it might have seemed like a quick change, but it's really been the product of a, of a lot of work and preparation. Uh, but I live in Dearborn, which is a totally Arab enclave. So, you know, I'm not really exposed to white people. I don't see white people that much. Only time I see white people is when I go to the airport. You know, when I see TSA it might be the only white people I see every week when I'm traveling for a show. I live in a very Arab Arab town. Uh, I love it. I didn't grow up with a lot of Arabs, so I kind of moved here on purpose. So I have so I have that all the time. It's beautiful. It's Ramadan right now. So the atmosphere is really beautiful. Um, I just love being with our people. You know, it's much different than white culture. I mean, you know, white culture is very much about individualism and you're on your own and you're kind of you have your privacy. And Arab culture is not about that at all. Arab culture is much more about a uh, collective community, and you have no privacy. Everyone is in everyone's business, but that's a trade-off. It, but also means everyone takes care of each other in a time of crisis. You know, I always explain it like this. I say, like, if you're white and you live in a white community and you are broke that week, you're going to be hungry. But if you live in Dearborn and you're broke that week, you go down to the store and you say, hey, Abu Hassan, I don't have money for groceries this week. And he says to you, take whatever you want. He says, take whatever you want, because he knows you, he knows your family. In fact, that week, you'll have more groceries than you've ever had in your life, probably. Everyone in the neighborhood is going to know that you were broke and you can't afford any groceries, but you won't be hungry. So which would you rather have, like hunger and privacy or shame and a full stomach? That is the trade-off of living in an Arab community and having Arab culture around you all the time. So, uh, Lema, did you ever live in America at all? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. I actually ended up in, after the Kuwait uh, war, which is the invasion, I was still in high school. I actually ended up in the suburbs of New Orleans. So I ended oh, up in, in Trump country, essentially Trump country. I mean, yeah, it was, it was Trump country before it was Trump country. Yeah, before it was even Trump country. I mean, it was like sort of yeah. like the where the seeds were being <laughs> growing, you know. So, yeah. So white people have this thing, especially in the law, as Lena would know. It's called John Doe. Okay, now John Doe is basically when somebody dies, and the police find them. And they don't have any identification and no one claims them. No one has reported them missing or anything like that. It's a John Doe. Okay. And and every city has a, a graveyard where they bury their John Doe's after 30 days or whatever of nobody claiming them. Now, this is a very white thing, you know, like, like uh, your family doesn't know where you are, all this kind of stuff. In our culture... If somebody dies within half an hour, I get a notice on my WhatsApp of who they are, their entire family tree, and uh, where their aza, you know, where the wake is going to be that evening. And everyone goes. It's a very communal thing, even if you don't know the person. I mean, aza has become like a a, a social uh, activity in Dearborn. Like sometimes I'll call my friend and be like, "Hey, I need to talk to you tonight." He'll be like, "What time?" It was seven o'clock. Are you busy? Oh, yeah, I have to go to Aza. I'm like, whose Aza is it? He says, oh, my dad's second cousin. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'll see you at the Aza because I need to talk to you. You know, like it becomes a social act. It becomes a place where you make an appointment because everyone is in everyone's business and everyone comes together in these times. And that is a beautiful thing about our culture. So, yeah, I live in the Midwest in a very American place, but it's this very Arab thing. And I really love it. And I just love being around our culture all the time. And you also uh, worked closely with Bernie Sanders, Amma Bernie, as you refer to him, who's been consistently vocal on Palestinian rights. In your opinion, will we see more U.S. elected officials take a bolder stance on Palestine? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was just a, a poll that came out about 
currently polling the Democratic Party and saying like 49 percent of Democrats have sympathy for the Palestinians and 38 percent have sympathy for the Israelis. So that's a big change. So I think you're going to see that play out politically. You know, Bernie was a major force in American presidential politics. And so we supported him because he changed the conversation about Palestine. Bernie wasn't perfect on Palestine. He still had some work to do, but he changed the pot, the conversation fully. And that that was a very important time. And even though he didn't win, the two sort of really deep, serious presidential campaigns changed a lot of Palestinian American activism and made us demand more from our uh, politicians. I mean, look, it, activists in America in 2016, they basically struck a deal with Bernie. They said, look, Bernie, you're pretty liberal, you're progressive. The people who follow you are progressive on this issue of Palestine. If you become more progressive in your rhetoric, we can bring a lot more people into the fold. It was a political calculation. I'm not saying he didn't believe those things, but everything politicians do comes with a political calculation. A Bernie less than most others, he just says what he thinks, but it's still everything is political. And so we were able to show that if you talk about justice for Palestinians and you talk about Palestinians as equal human beings, that can translate into lots and lots of votes. You know, in 2016, in, in the place where Arabs have the heaviest voting block in Michigan. Um, we were the community that pushed Bernie over the top to win the primary against Hillary Clinton in 2016. That became a real thing. Yes, I think other politicians are going to see that. Now, who are going to be the kinds of politicians that fill in sort of Bernie's shoes in presidential politics? Because I don't think he's going to run again. You know, there's a handful out there that might do it, whether it's this cycle or another cycle. I don't know. But I can think of a lot of them right now that might might do it. And so that that is something we have to keep our eyes open for and be ready to be active again on, on this issue on a presidential level. How do you feel about all of the anti-boycott laws that are being passed all over the United States at the moment, um, not allowing basically the criticism, any criticism of the state of Israel and that IHRA definition of anti-Semitism? What is your take on that issue? Well, you know, I feel really bad for the Israelis. I mean, they, this is this is the kinds of things that they're resorting to now. You know, they can't have a real conversation about anything. So they have to go and uh, convince uh, politicians to pass openly anti-constitutional uh, laws. And so they've been struck down when they've been challenged in most places. I actually think it's a it's a good thing because it keeps the conversation going. It shows how re to what ridiculous lengths they will go to to stop a conversation. I mean, there's only one reason you try to shut up the other side. And that's usually because you're lying. You know, if you're lying and you're kind of insecure about your position, then part of your strategy becomes to shut up the other side. So this is and this is kind of clear. People kind of understand that, that that's what you do. And so I think it's such a mistake by them to pursue these uh, laws that I'm actually happy that they're doing it. It keeps the conversation going. And uh, yes, the fact that these laws are on the books is terrible. It's very uh, un-American, anti-constitutional. At the same time, it keeps the conversation going of, about Palestine and what we are trying to talk about all the time. So as you might know, of a couple months ago, the Supreme Court declined to take up the issue, which was a very interesting decision by them because there had been a couple sort of conflicting decisions in federal courts. You, th you thought they would take it up and kind of put an end to this. Uh, but they didn't. So that keeps the debate going as well, which I'm OK with. But, you know, they've run out of ideas, the Israeli. I mean, they've run out of ideas. They don't really can't really have an argument about the actual merits. And so they just say, hey, we don't I don't want to talk about this anymore. And, and you know, as a as a lawyer, when somebody says, I don't want to talk about it anymore, that means they lost. I mean, that means they don't have any more arguments to make. And so, you know, that's what's going on with all of this. Anna, what advice would you give uh, young activists on uh, U.S. campuses currently on how to tackle, you know, the claims, you know, the ADLs of this world on anti-Semitism and trying to silence them or to push them into inaction? What would be your advice? I always tell people that there is every pro-Israel uh, argument can be answered in one of two ways. Uh, either you say that's a lie or you say that doesn't matter. And, you know, because lies and deflection are their only game. And just keep it very simple. So there's no really need to get into, first of all, you don't need to answer directly just because a, a, a pro-Israel person 
asks a question about subject X, it doesn't mean you have to get into subject X with them, okay? They are trying to deflect and sort of waste time and make the audience uninterested because they don't really want to get into a conversation about everything. So there's no obligation to engage with them on their uh, terms. Keep it simple, right? They stole our land, they kicked this out, and they don't let us come back. That's it, really. We're not really mad about anything else. It's like the only thing we're mad about. Always bring it back to that and tell stories about that and be very clear. And if you want to dismantle their arguments, don't have a back and forth. You know, when they say, you know, here's a good one. There was never a Palestinian state. Okay, so what? I mean, what does that have to do with anything? You know, that that doesn't matter. You kicked us out. You stole our land. You don't let us come back. It doesn't matter whether we had a state or didn't have a state. Oh, Yasser Arafat invented the term Palestinians in 1965. Before that, there was nothing called Palestinians. Well, that's a lie, but it also doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter what you called us in 1948, whether you called us Palestinians or Arabs or, or Syrians or Martians. We were there. We were there and you kicked us out and you stole our land and you don't let us come back. You know, everything they bring up is a, a deflection or a lie. And so just point out that it's a deflection or a lie and then come back to the topic. And the topic is you, you, you kicked us out, you stole our land and you don't let us come back. That is the only reason we're mad. We're not mad about anything else. We don't care about your background. We don't care that your what your religion was, why you think you did it. It really doesn't matter to us. Well, what I matters is that you kicked us out and stole our land and you don't let us come back. But we are upset about falafel and hummus being claimed as non-Palestinian. That's part of stealing the land. It's, it's yeah, misappropriating right. The land misappropriating the culture, misappropriating everything. That's by that's the way. By the way, if they if they yeah. didn't kick us out, and, right? If they didn't kick us out and steal our land and didn't let us come back, we wouldn't care that they want to eat falafel and hummus and say that it's Israeli or say that it belongs to them. I mean, you know, in the whole history of Palestine. You know, Palestine has has been this destination for 4,000 years because of many reasons, including God. You know, it's been this destination. That means everybody has made their way to Palestine. Everybody has conquered it. There's a reason Palestinians look like everything. And that's because every, I always say everybody has come to Palestine. and Everybody came to Palestine and everybody came in Palestine. So we look like everything. OK, this is why we look like everything. And so th that also means it's been a destination where everybody has wanted to come for 3000 years. And that is a beautiful thing. And so we are actually descendants of of everybody who's been there for including Jews and, and and including Romans and Byzantines and Greeks and Turks and Mongols and Arabs and Crusaders for a minute and Africans. We look like everything. But there's only been three times in the history, this long history of Palestine, where people have come there and tried to kick out the people that were there, replace them, ethnic cleansing. Uh, the Romans did it to the Jews in the first century. Uh, the Crusaders did it and tried to do it in the 10th and 11th century. And then the Israelis. That has been the only times where people, and that has been the main conflicts when people have tried to kick out other people. Um, that is the sort of uh, root of why we're angry. They kicked us out. They stole our land. They don't let us come back. There's really no other reason. And so we have to keep it simple. Yes, we're mad about these other things, but they're all symptoms of the disease. You know, I look at I look at the incident that happened last week or maybe it was early this week where there was a car of three settlers in the West Bank that were uh, attacked and and shot two daughters and a mother by a Palestinian. And yes, it's terrible. And uh, I wish that none of that stuff happened. I never condemn Palestinians for uh, being violent because of the situation that that they live in. It's not a justification, but you have to look at what's going on. And we do understand that because in America, there was a slave called Nat Turner who performed a slave rebellion in the 18, I think, uh, 20s, 20s or 30s, 1830, actually. And uh, he was a slave and he escaped and he got other slaves and they would go house to house and murder white women and children in those houses. And they were caught and they were executed. Now, when we look back in history, yes, we say that that's a terrible thing. You know, we wish nobody would do that. But we look at it in the context of slavery. We look at it in the context of what drives somebody 
to do that? What is the underlying disease? We look at Nat Turner as a symptom of the injustice and the disease of slavery, not as, oh, black people, all black people are terrorists. And, you know, that's that. And so that's the same way we have to look at any sort of Palestinian violence. But at the same time, even when we see something that might seem to us as irrational or overly violent, um, let's look at wh why. Why do people do these things? That's what we have to be addressing if we really care. And I think it's true for any of us. You know, if remember when those teenage boys from Jerusalem were taking knives and they were attacking Israeli soldiers and then, and then they were getting killed. We all know, I hope, that if, if I were to come across any of these kids, if I were to come across a 15-year-old Palestinian kid with a knife and I saw him walking down the street with Jerusalem, what would I do? I would grab him and I would say, hey, I don't want you to do this because his life is worth so much. And violence is is uh, not what we want to engage in. But when I stopped him from doing that, then my job becomes telling everyone in the world why he was going to do that. What what are the underlying circumstances that make somebody do something like that? So we don't want to be violent. And in fact, we Palestinians are extremely peaceful. I mean, when you go to Palestine and you see the way that they treat us, uh, you would think when you see checkpoints and all that kind of stuff. You would think that, you know, why don't Palestinians blow this kind of stuff up every day? But we don't because we're not actually violent. You know, it's not that's not our nature. The violence comes very much from the other side. And so while we have a right to defend ourselves and maybe even a right to sometimes be be a violent, it's not something that I think we should engage in. And why would I engage with the Israelis in the only sort of realm in which I can't beat them? I mean, they've shown they're willing to be much more violent and ruthless than we are. I'd much rather engage with the Israelis in the realms of art and intellectual thought and activism where I know I can beat them. You know, I don't want to engage with them in, in the realm of violence because I know that they're much more violent than I am. I know that they're much more ruthless than we are, that they're willing to do things that are much more violent than we've ever been willing to do. This is not about like pacifism. It's not about that we don't have a right to do these things. But hey, if Mike Tyson walked up to me and he said, hey, we're going to have a competition and the winner gets a million dollars, would you rather box or would you rather have a spelling bee? I'd be like, well, Mike Tyson, I'd rather have a spelling bee. I don't really want to box you, you know, if, we're, if I'm given the choice. You know, why would I want to box Mike Tyson? So that that's the same thing. You know, they, they are better at violence than we are. I don't really want to engage with them violently. and But they do. They do. And so that's why we have to be very careful. Let's not fall into their traps. So one question that I have for you, since you are engaged somehow a, a bit in U.S. politics and you are quite close to a number of Congress people as well, do you think that Palestine will eventually become a ticket item during the, the presidential elections in the United States? Do you think that this is actually a possibility? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, Bernie Bernie changed the dynamic. So there's no way in 2024 it doesn't come up. It's going to be something. Now, the real question is, how do we as a community deal with it? Do we react to it in the right way? Are we willing to tell politicians no? In other words, you know, do we have to accept the lesser of two evils when it comes to Palestine, like Biden? I'm not sure Biden was the lesser of two evils when it comes to Palestine. I mean, I kind of like Trump and his craziness and like, I always said Trump and Netanyahu, if you give them like five or 10 years together, they'll liberate Palestine by accident. You know, they'll just they'll do they'll do everything crazy so that uh, the liberation comes much more quickly. And Biden is kind of like a smart Zionist, you know, which I don't really want. I'd rather have a bunch of dumb Zionists running the country. But it is going to be an issue. Yes. As we see, you know, Palestine never leaves the sort of American consciousness and uh, when presidential races uh, and campaigns come up, yes, Bernie changed that. Bernie energized the Arab American community in a way that we don't feel sort of like sidelined anymore. We don't feel marginalized and we don't feel ashamed to bring up the topic of Palestine. You know, a lot of times in the past, people said, oh, Palestine, you know, uh, it's going to muddy the waters. It's going to create uh, unnecessary division. We're not worried about that anymore. Now we're happy to bring it up and talk about it. Bernie's campaigns changed everything when it comes to that. I would imagine also that the implication on U.S. taxes, the you know four billion plus, would also be a good selling point to the Americans. No. Yeah, and in fact, in some ways, it's a it's a good selling point to sort of the right wingers. I mean, there's a lot of right wing isolationists in America who believe in fiscal conservatism and think that some of this is wasted money. 
So there's all kinds of angles to bring that up. Yeah, I mean, I talk about it all the time. I mean, they, we still don't, we still have communities. I mean, Flint still doesn't have totally clean water, you know, six Imagine. or seven years after 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 their thing. And the federal government could fix that if they didn't, this, someone said it, it would take a billion dollars to dig up every pipe and replace every pipe in Flint. And so, I, you know, I've said before that if you don't give money to Israel, Israel gets $3 billion at least a year. If you don't give money to Israel for one year, you could fix the water in Flint three times. I mean, you could you could mess up twice and only get it right on the third time. And that would just be one year of giving money to to Israel. So yeah, we do have to talk about it in terms of that because it's not like we don't have our own problems. It's not like we don't have, you know, if we had free college and no homelessness and uh, fully insured, uh, for, you know, people who were fully insured in, in, for their health care, uh, then, you know, maybe giving $3 billion to Israel would be a luxury. But it's not a luxury. It's a choice. It's a political choice because we have we have other problems we could give that money to, but we choose not to. And so that is an important point to make uh, to Americans. Yes. And um, I mean, what about this relationship with violence? I mean, we, we have the United States, which, which is today the most uh, expensive army in the world, has the most expensive army. And then we have Israel, which has the most sophisticated army in the world. And we have two countries that are extremely violent in nature. This week alone in the United States, there were multiple killings. And the, where, there was a six-year-old who shot his teacher, I mean, in the United yeah. States. And the only other environment that this really occurs around the world is actually Israel. So they're both quite violent in, in, in nature and as far as, you know, their arms and their defense is concerned. I would think that would be a fantastic selling point to the United States to stop all of this, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, America, <laughs> America has been violent from the beginning. I mean, everything, America has, I think, 250 years, and <clears throat> there's only been a few years where they haven't been at war. You know, and Israel's the same way. But By the way, this is what America means when they say Israel and America have shared values. You know, they, all the politicians say we have shared values with Israelis. Well, the shared values are not democracy and human rights and, and pluralism. The shared values are ethnic cleansing and war and violence and and the 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 suppression of minorities you know these are the shared values and so um you know there was a a, a an israeli diplomat in the 70s that uh, was quoted as saying to his american counterpart he said to him uh, you have your indians and we have ours okay so i mean you know they know what they're doing and they know what they did and the same thing with the americans and so uh, violence is a is a uniquely um, I don't want to say uniquely, but it's much more practiced here. And it's uniquely part of our history, you know, uh, that we learn and that we uh, exercise and that we normalize. I mean, Americans know that they violently ethnically cleansed uh, tens of millions of natives from their land and no one really feels bad about it. You know, I've been to Australia and Canada, and they've gotten to a point where <clears throat> they call the natives. They're also settler colonial nations who who kicked out the natives. Um, but they've gotten to a point where they call the natives in those countries first peoples or indigenous. In America, we still call Native Americans Indians, which, again, is a misidentification by Columbus because he got lost and he thought he was in India. Okay. And yet we still call them Indians. In fact, the bureau that deals with that in the, in the federal government is still called the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 2023 because they can't bring themselves to call it indigenous or native or first peoples. Because if you do that, you have to fully confront your violent, violent past in dealing with these people and it'll it'll kill most of your myths that you've been telling about yourself which is um you know we were here first and this is our destiny and all this kind of stuff so you know there is a lot that goes into this uh game of american exceptionalism um that i'm not sure they're ready to uh, uh confront and with that comes practicing violence every single day so let's just take it one step further then. If the Americans really cannot recognize this sort of violence, 
why is there so much success with the Ukraine in the United States? I mean, I was recently in Manhattan and everywhere I went, I found tags, free Ukraine, free Ukraine, fuck uh, Russia, fuck Russia, fuck Putin, like all over the place. So why can they get on board with that issue, yet they can't get on board with the Palestinian issue, right? The Americans aren't as stupid well, as, as everyone, you know, perceives well, them to be. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that's true. I'm, I'm pretty sure well, they are as stupid as everybody perceives them to be. I mean, we have a game show in America called Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader That Nobody Wins? I do think that they might be as stupid as everybody thinks they are. We are. But, well, the answer to that question is pretty simple. I mean, whiteness is still treasured in this country. And so seeing white victims, and remember, Israelis have always been typecast as white in America as well. You know, think of it like this, Lena. Okay, the fight for gay rights in America has been going on for about 50 years or so. And in 2015, they got what was really the, the ultimate victory, which was a Supreme Court saying that marriage is a fundamental right and that you can't be discriminated against because of your sexuality. So gay marriage is legal and a right all throughout America, okay? They could not have hoped for a better result in America than that. And that took about 40 or 50 years to get to that point. Black people are still, for 400 years, being killed in the street. Nobody's going to jail for it. Latinos have to be told that they don't belong in America, even though half of America used to be Mexico. OK, you have white people telling uh, Mexicans that they don't belong in places called San Antonio and El Paso and San Diego, places that they named. OK, you have uh, natives still not being given any of the justice that they deserve after 400 years. But this civil rights issue of gay rights got solved to its maximum, I mean, its maximum very quickly. Why? Because what is the face of? of the gay rights movement in America. And by the way, I'm with their rights being solved. You know, I think it's great. But why? Because the face of the gay rights movement is white men. Yes, there are non-white gay people, but the face of the gay rights movement has always been white and especially white men. And white civil rights issues get solved very quickly, okay? The, the person who wrote the gay marriage Supreme Court opinion uh, was a, a white Republican. He's a Republican. It wasn't even a Democrat that wrote that. White Republicans sympathetic to gay marriage rights. Well, because they have a gay son or a gay nephew or a gay grandchild. They don't have a black son or a Mexican nephew or, or a Native American grandchild. And th those things don't mean anything to them. But gay rights does. And so these white civil rights issues get solved very quickly. Well, what's Ukraine? It's white people suffering. So it becomes something that is very centralized in America. And Russia is the is the ultimate em enemy. Uh, but if every gay person in America was black, gay marriage would be like the most illegal thing in America. You would not gay people would not be getting married. If the only people that liked guns in America were Mexican, you'd never be able to buy a gun in America. But since these are white civil rights issues, they they get solved very quickly and they're sacred. That's what's going on with Ukraine. It's very simple. This is why they can so easily get on TV uh, when it first happened and say, you know, it's so shocking that this is happening in a civilized place. This is not Iraq or Afghanistan, those uncivilized places over there, right? That's what this is all about. Um, so when you are making the sort of link between Ukraine and Palestine, you always have to point out that hypocrisy you know you have to say very clearly just imagine that these palestinians have blonde hair and blue eyes then maybe you ever watch this movie called a time to kill in a in a, it was a, a 1996 movie with matthew mcconaughey and yes. samuel L. jackson and kevin spacey it's about a a black man who kills his uh daughter's rapist and he's on trial for that and when M matthew mcconaughey is giving the final closing argument he's talking about what everybody knows is the story of this young black girl who was raped by these guys and as he's telling the story of course everybody knows that she's black and then he ends the story by saying well now imagine that she's white and so now how now how would you feel about what happened to her right and so it's the same kind of thing with palestinians you know if, if it, race is at the center of every analysis in American society. Race is never not part of the analysis when you're talking about any issue in American society. And the same goes with Ukraine and Palestine. Well said. 
Thank you so much, Ahmed. It's been a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you. And let me say to you what I always say when I'm a room full of Palestinians and that we always have to say to each other, we have to never be ashamed to say it, which is that I love you both and I'm proud of you both and keep doing what you're doing. And keep inspiring Thank you. us. Thank and you we so love much. you so much. Yes. Thanks, ladies. See you very soon, inshallah. Thank you for joining us this week on Free Palestine Pod. Subscribe, like, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. And be sure to come back next week for a new episode of Free Palestine Pod. Let's talk Palestine.